Good morning. Happy Monday. I have neuro coffee in hand and it is perfect as usual. Okay. Got a big Monday. Um, I fast you call Q&A today, this afternoon, Bill Standard Time, so I'll see you I fast you people there. If you're not on I fast you, I suggest you get signed up. The Q&As have been pretty, pretty awesome and spectacular, covering a lot of ground and making some, some uh, great progress with, with our coaches. So it's been really, really cool to do that. Also, had to go dark night today uh, because the new Batman trailer was out, so all of you comic book geeks out there, I'm sure you were fascinated and thrilled, and, and it's great to see Batman coming back even though it's a year away. So, got that off the table. Let's dig into a Q&A. This comes from Javi. I think it's Javi. J-A-V-I. Hope I said that right. And Javi says, keep blowing our minds with all the stuff you do. Well, that's very nice of you to say. Can you explain how right piriformis pain can be caused using your model? I have a client... Uh, who is a narrow ISA with right hip internal rotation at 20 and, and I'm assuming right buttock pain. Um, she can palm the floor and has a 100 degree straight leg raise. So I'm going to assume that's a right straight leg raise that you are talking about, kind sir. So first and foremost, let's talk about this piriformis thing for a second. I have an opinion about this that at some point in time, the anatomists that named these things were staring at some sort of an anatomical chart on the wall. They threw a dart at the, at the hip and it landed in the piriformis and they decided that, okay, the piriformis is the muscle that we're going to pick on. It gets a lot of attention. It's, it's a cool muscle, of course, but um, gets way too much attention. So let's not pick on a particular structure. Let's just say that we have some posterior hip pain under these circumstances because there's a lot of stuff back there. It's a very busy area. And to, to pick on one thing I think is is unnecessary and, and distracting. It makes us think about things. By, we, we start calling these things by a name and it distracts us from what the real problem is. Under these circumstances, in most cases, when we have this, this type of a presentation, what we're dealing with is somebody that cannot capture sufficient internal rotation during maximum propulsion. And so what, the, what they're doing is they're trying to create an orientation that allows them to do that, which is why we see some of these, these cool measures. Now, Javit, you didn't give me much to work with, so good thing we got Batman on today because we got to play detective. And so we're going to put some pieces together. I'm going to talk you through a sequence here, and then I'm going to throw you a, a couple of measures that will help guide you that you might need to do, um, but hopefully give you something something that, that's useful. So let's go through this scenario a little bit. I'm going to grab the pelvis so we have it in hand as we go through this. Okay. So we're starting with a narrow ISA. So we know that we've gonna, we're going to have an out that, that, that looks something like that. That immediately biases towards greater external rotation, less internal rotation. So that kind of fits your, your bill so far because we had the right hip IR in deficit. She can touch her, I'm assuming it's a she, um, I don't know why I said that. Oh yeah, she has palms to, to the floor toe touch, that's why I said she. So she has a palms to floor toe touch, which means that you probably got an anterior orientation and we have an eccentric orientation of this, this posterior lower uh, musculature that allows the pelvis to move through this full excursion. The straight leg raise of 100 degrees is, is going to be useful. So that is excessive. To a, to a slight degree. Um, again, we're making an assumption that's going to be the right straight leg raise. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to use the straight leg raise to guide what this pelvic orientation means to us. And then once we understand that, now we can define a strategy. So I got a 100 degree straight leg raise on the right. What I want you to do is I want you to take that straight leg raise and I want you to compare it to the left. So if the right straight leg raise at 100 degrees is greater than the left straight leg raise, you most likely have a posterior compression on the left side that is turning the pelvis to the right. And that's going to result in a reduction in left hip external rotation. So that's going to be a, a, flat, a flatter turn into this, this right hip. When you do the straight leg raise, what's happening, why you get the excessive straight leg raise, is as you bring it up, it, it's allowing the pelvis to turn away, and that's why you get 100 degrees on that side. Now, 
if you compare straight leg raises again and you get a left straight leg raise that is greater than the right, what you've got is a pelvis that's tipped on an oblique axis. So it's actually tipped up like that. So it's tipped over in that direction, which means that you have greater eccentric orientation on this, this posterior left lower side than you do on the right side and it tips it up. So when you do this straight leg raise, you're not actually raising it up in flexion, you're raising it up closer to an abducted position. So if, if we have a difference in the straight leg raise, then we have a difference in, in the problem. So again, the right straight leg raise greater would be a posterior lower compression on the left, a left straight leg raise greater, and you got a right oblique tilt, okay? So if the right straight leg raise is greater, what you need to do is delay the left propulsion, but you're gonna, you're gonna start, if you're, if you're in sort of like a rehabish mode, you're gonna start in right side laying activities or an offset quadruped is gonna be a great place for you to start because you gotta delay this propulsive strategy on the left side. When you go into the gym, then what I want you to do is I want you to start with a left foot forward split squat orientation. So we gotta get relative motions and we have to delay the propulsive strategy. So we're gonna use a, a hip shift. So we're gonna push this, this, this left hip backwards in that split stance uh, position. Um, you can then go into like a right to left half kneeling cable chop with the right knee down. Um, yeah, as far as carry activities, you could do a left rack carry, which is gonna help delay that left propulsive strategy. And then you wanna use a backward sled drag as conditioning, um, which will allow you to emphasize this, this posterior hip shift. Now, if the left straight leg raise is greater, so remember the left straight leg is greater, you got, a, you got an oblique tilt. So we gotta use the right side to push back and to the left to reorient the, this pelvis. So now left side side lying activities with a right propulsive strategy are where you're gonna wanna go from a rehabish standpoint. And then when you go to the gym, we're gonna do half kneeling activities or, or a split stance activity with the, with the right knee up, left knee down. Um, I like to use like a, like a Paloff split squat um, or something like that. You're gonna do a right to left um, uh, split stance, side split stance, cable chop, left suitcase carry under these circumstances. Again, because what we need to do is we have to create this a stronger right propulsive phase and the, and the suitcase carry on the left is gonna do that. And then you're gonna use a crossover sled drag instead of the straight posterior sled drag. Because again, we wanna create this stronger right propulsive strategy to, to offset the oblique axis. So Javi, I hope that gives you some ideas about what you're looking at and a way to, to diagnose what you're looking at and then some strategies in the gym. So if you have any further questions, go to askbillhartman at gmail.com, askbillhartman at gmail.com, and I'll see you guys.